Week three of Big Brother 26 has come and gone, and I didn't think this season could get any crazier. I genuinely thought week one was going to be our peak chaos, but we've somehow managed to surpass that. With absolutely ludicrous plans, numerous fights, and one of the secret upgrades being activated, how did it all break down? Well, that's why I'm here. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down and recapping the events of week three of Big Brother 26 and giving my updated power rankings. So with all of that preamble out of the way, it is the one and only RJ21 here, and let's get into the Big Brother 26 week three recap and power rankings. Week three started off with the Ainsley Land HOH competition, a life-size version of Candyland with a twist. It was essentially the balance beam competition, except the house guests had to go around the balance beams collecting points. Whoever collected the most amount of points in the shortest amount of time would become the new head of household. The top three ultimately came down to Cedric, Kenny, and Quinn, with Cedric winning the head of household competition. What's ironic about this HOH win is that Cedric was a BB AI mascot in week one, so it's just funny thinking that both of the AI mascots in week one in Chelsea and Cedric went on to win the next consecutive HOHs, so I think that's just pretty funny. Just like his fellow AI mascot in Chelsea, Cedric wanted this HOH to be as clean and bloodless as possible. There was already a pretty consensus house targeted Angela, so it was really up to Cedric to just find the two pawns that were going to sit next to her. Kenny goes up to Cedric and essentially tells Cedric that he wants to be nominated because he wants to go home. His head and his heart are no longer in the game and he just doesn't have the passion to fight anymore. However, we're going to see this waiver throughout the week, so take this comment with a grain of salt, at least for now. With Kenny volunteering himself to be up on the block and Angela being the consensus target, all Cedric needs to do is find one more nominee. And Cedric is thinking of nominating Mackenzie as that pawn. However, Mackenzie and Cedric have a conversation in which Mackenzie tells Cedric about her power. She doesn't exactly tell Cedric what the power does exactly, but she does tell Cedric that she has the power, which deters Cedric from wanting to nominate Mackenzie at all. Cedric tries going around finding pawns in the likes of Leah, Rubina, and Joseph. However, all three of them deny it because it's never smart to volunteer yourself as a pawn. Luckily for Cedric, Tucker comes in and saves the day by volunteering himself as a pawn yet again. However, this time, Tucker has the intention of volunteering himself in an attempt to flush Mackenzie's power out of the game. So, at the nomination ceremony, Cedric chooses to nominate Angela, Kenny, and Tucker, with Angela as the primary target. Tucker and Kimo are having a conversation about the whereabouts of the second power, since nearly everybody knows that Mackenzie has the first power. It's in this conversation where Kimo reveals that back in week one, Quinn told him about the secret power, to which Kimo then confirms to Tucker that Quinn does have the power, reaffirming all of Angela's leaks to Tucker. We then pick players for the veto competition where Mackenzie and Leah are chosen to compete. The veto competition this week was called Recharge My Core. Essentially, houseguests had to maneuver this core around an obstacle course while not hitting the vines. If they hit the vines, their core loses power. Whoever makes it to the end of the course in the fastest time with the most amount of power would win the power of veto. Ultimately, the competition comes down to Mackenzie, Tucker, and Kenny, with Tucker coming out and winning the power of veto. It's after Tucker's veto win where everything breaks down into chaos because Tucker is bored and wants to shake up the dynamics of the game. Tucker and Cam have a conversation where Tucker tells Cam that Quinn has the secret power and Quinn did not tell the rest of the Andersons alliance. Cam then tells Cedric about the power, creating a lot of mistrust between Cedric and Quinn because they're in the Pentagon together and Cedric thought that that alliance was real, but maybe it's not real to Quinn. Cedric and Joseph later confront Quinn in the backyard, giving Quinn the opportunity to fess up to having the power. However, Quinn denies these claims and says that Lisa most likely went out with it, continuing to push this narrative that Quinn does not have the power, which Cedric doesn't believe, since he knows that Quinn has the power. Tucker, Kenny, Cam, and Cedric gather in the HOH room and create a new alliance called the Ball Handlers with the intention of targeting Quinn and flushing his power out of the game. So, Tucker comes up with this crazy plan where he doesn't use the veto on himself, but instead uses it on Angela to where Cedric would then blindside Quinn and put him up in a position where Quinn cannot activate his power. However, Cedric wasn't as loyal to this plan as Tucker initially thought, as at the veto ceremony, Tucker went through on his part of the plan by choosing to use the power of veto not on himself, but on Angela, blindsiding both Angela and the rest of the house. Cedric then goes up to make his replacement nominee and blindsides Tucker by nominating Mackenzie as the replacement nominee instead of Quinn. Unfortunately for Cedric, Mackenzie chooses to activate America's veto, vetoing herself off of the block and leaving a vacant spot 
on the nomination block for America to vote and fill in. After the veto ceremony, numerous fights break down because of how many people were blindsided by what just happened. A house meeting was called in which Quinn's power was publicly outed, where Quinn was basically forced to admit that he had the second power and was lying to nearly everybody about it. It's after this house meeting where Cedric and Tucker then get into their own personal fight, where Tucker claims that Cedric blindsided him despite Cedric telling him that he didn't want to go through the, with the plan because he believed that he didn't have the numbers and that the plan wasn't going to be as successful as Tucker initially thought. We then get to the live eviction night where America chooses to nominate Quinn as the replacement nominee. Kenny, Quinn, and Tucker then compete in the data dump BBAI competition. Basically, the house guests had to collect all of these red dots, and the first house guest to collect all 20 red dots and then hit their button would win the BBAI arena and save themselves from the block. In the end, Tucker ends up winning this competition, winning his second BBAI arena in a row, saving himself from the block. We then get to the live eviction vote, where by a vote of 10 to 1, Kenny is officially the third house guest to be evicted from the Big Brother 26 house, with only Tucker voting to keep Kenny. This is Big Brother. This is Big Brother. Now let's get into the power rankings. At number 14, the most recently evicted house guest, we have Kenny, and thank god this guy is finally out of the house. He has been moping around for so long and has actively shown that he does not want to be there to the point where the edit is dunking on him. Typically the edit doesn't highlight whenever a house guest wants to quit or wants to leave the game because it kind of generates a bit of like bad press and it is a bit of like a taboo topic. So Big Brother doesn't typically highlight it. But the fact that the editors went out of their way to dunk on Kenny because of how much he's flip-flopping his beliefs about either wanting to stay or wanting to go, it's absolutely insane. Thank God he's finally out of the house because now we actually have people who are there that actually want to continue playing this game. He was so bothersome in the house like it was so clear how much he was act actively loathing his time in the house it was getting genuinely infuriating like the fact that he finally got this opportunity after so long and then becomes resolute in wanting to give up this opportunity it's absolutely insane to me his gameplay reflects this too because he chose to do nothing in his time here and it sucks because the times he actually tried to do stuff he was somewhat effective he was able to at least get into some sort of alliances. He was able to have be, build up this perception that he could be an ally that could be picked up, but he chooses to drop all of this because he wants to go home. And now he does get to go home. And at least he gets to see his wife and kids, which is why he's here at number 14. When I woke up this morning and I was good. I felt good. I was happy for you. I really appreciate it. And then now well, I want to go home. Now it's time to talk about the players that are actually still in the game. At number 13, the house is I believe to be in the worst position is Tucker. And despite how much entertainment Tucker brought this week, he played this week absolutely horribly. I mean, he was in a pretty comfortable position. I mean, volunteering to go up on the block again wasn't necessarily like a bad decision, but it wasn't going to like tank his game. Like it wasn't great, but it wasn't going to be game ending. However, it's after he wins the veto where he absolutely just tanks everything. He makes this really crazy plan that honestly, I don't think it would have ever worked. Quinn was so well insulated that he, there, the votes would have never been there to take Quinn out at all. And Tucker essentially made himself the biggest target in the house, demonstrating that he can not only win competitions to keep himself safe, he's willing to make these big, massive, risky moves if it means taking out a huge power player. And Tucker has now built this perception of him being a loose cannon, somebody who can't be trusted with information, somebody who, if you're on the opposing side of him, he is going to be coming after you full steam ahead. And that is not the type of player you want to keep in the game. So as of right now, he is a huge, like massive number one target. It's gotten to the point where even some of his closest allies in Rubina have talked about possibly voting Tucker out if it meant putting themselves in a better position. Now, Tucker is going to be a valuable ally as a weapon to target some of the opposition, such as Quinn and Cedric, but it's still not a great position to be in because if Tucker doesn't win this next HOH, he's going to go up on the block. Mind you, he is going to have like two opportunities to save himself, and that can be enough there because he is pretty good in these dang competitions, but Tucker is still a huge target, and that's not helping him in any sense, which is why he's here at number 13. That didn't work. It's like a truck going under the Sturrow Bridge. Always hits the top. If you're from Boston, you get that reference. Oh. At number 12, I have 
Angela. And Angela is essentially the secondary target if Tucker were to win either the veto competition or the BBAI arena. Angela still has nothing going on in this game. She still has no allies, nobody wants to pick her up as a number, nobody wants to necessarily work with her, and it's all because of the chaos she created in week one. Mind you, I think because of how the whole Tucker blow up has happened, there are now really big massive targets that the opposing sides are going to be going after in the likes of Tucker or Quinn in that instance, but Angela is still going to be that secondary target that nobody really cares to keep in the house. Angela has built very little social capital in this game. Hell, she didn't even know she was going to be saved. I mean, that was a part of the plan, but still, if you're Angela and you don't even know that you're being saved, that just shows how little you actually know about what's going on in the game. It's very clear that Angela has this vendetta against Quinn, and she's actively going to be trying to get that plan to happen, but it's not going to happen. No matter how much Angela wants to happen, there's no way Angela is going to get Quinn out before Quinn gets Angela out. Angela has very little backing, she has very little social capital, and she still has no allies. So unless she directly wins an HOH and has the ability to target Quinn, it's not going to happen. And Angela is still going to continue being this massive and easy house target for people to just nominate and just keep on the block in case things go wrong. And it's this really poor positioning to why I have her here at number 12. I did feel bad. And she left her darn glitter here. Shoot! We let her throw it away now? At number 11, I have Mackenzie. And now that Mackenzie doesn't have America's Veto, she is essentially screwed. I mean, America's Veto was the one ticket that was keeping her off of the block, but now that she doesn't have this secret upgrade, she is pretty much open and ready to be put up on the block. Mackenzie has been pretty much playing a floater game up until this point. Mackenzie hasn't been a point of contention because people have been keeping her safe because of her power, but now that she doesn't have her power, people have no reason to not put her up on the block. She is probably going to be the pawn star for the upcoming weeks, and even though Mackenzie does have some backing in the likes of Leah, it's still not enough. She's not being included in any alliances. She made this girls alliance, but most of the girls in the girls alliance don't even believe it's real because they have better options. However, Mackenzie doesn't have better options. That girls alliance is all she has and she is trying to hold on to it, but it's ultimately not working out for her. Mackenzie has very little backing outside of Leah and she is essentially this floater figure in the house. Now, this could put her in one of the best positions in the game because there is no really solid power structure as of right now and people should be incentivized to pick up the likes of Mackenzie considering how she is decently good in these competitions. However, Mackenzie has built so little social capital with these people despite having a secret power that she's not actively being included in a lot of things in a position where she most likely should be. Like, I think Mackenzie would have been a pretty good ally, but because Mackenzie is choosing to not do any active gaming, nobody wants to pick her up as an ally. And it's this really, really bad gameplay and social positioning to where I have her here at number 11. I don't want to talk about it. I literally trip over my shoe. If I didn't fall, I would have beaten Quinn. At number 10, I have... Leah. And Leah has 100% attached herself to Mackenzie at the hip at this point. Like, the two of them are inseparable, both in terms of like their presence within the house and in gameplay. Like, Leah is not branching out and trying to make other alliances unless Mackenzie is also included in those alliances. Like, it's bad. Like, you have all of these potential allies that could boost your position in the game. She has the likes of Cam and Quinn who do want to work with Leah, but Leah is actively turning these deals and alliances down. Like, it just doesn't make that much sense to me. Sure, she's building a lot of good personal bonds, but in terms of gameplay, that's not really going to be doing her that much. She doesn't have any real allies outside of Mackenzie, and she has these people who want to work with her, but for some reason she's just choosing not to, and it's so infuriating because she has this potential to build this trust. She has this potential to ingratiate herself into some sort of alliances. Like People want to actively bring Leah in, but Leah is just not being receptive to this. Like. Leah is essentially in the same position as Mackenzie, except people actually want to work with Leah. Like people actually want to include her in alliances. People actually want to work with Leah, at least in the short term. But for some reason, Leah is just choosing to ignore all of these options and it's keeping her in this really poor position. She's essentially a floater just like Mackenzie, 
but I don't know if it's going to work out for Leah. Like, she was almost a pawn this week, and she was almost a secondary target. Like, if Tucker didn't pull the shenanigans that he did, Leah probably would have gone up as the replacement nominee, and that is absolutely horrible. And it's a sign of how bad her positioning is right now, which is why I have her here at number 10. My strategy with this power core is to be one with the power core and to become the power core. Damn! At number nine, I have Rubina. And this was a bad week for Rubina all around. Early in the week, Rubina got caught trying to make this sort of side deal and side alliance, and that made her a primary target to where she was almost put up as an initial pawn by Cedric. However, Tucker volunteered himself and basically saved Rubina in that instance, but still, that's pretty bad that Rubina got caught trying to play the game, and people are now actively wanting to target her because of that. Rubina has been trying to build this alliance that has been up in the air for a very long time, consisting of herself and t -Core and Chemo and Tucker and Brooklyn and Quinn. Like she's been trying to build this, but she's just been unsuccessful in solidifying these numbers. And because of Tucker's huge blow up, that alliance is never going to happen now. Maybe that alliance is going to happen with just the five of them and not Quinn, but still, Rubina is in a really bad position. It's gotten to the point where people are now associating Rubina and Tucker as this big duo. And if people like Quinn are going to win HOH and actively be targeting Tucker, the number one way to weaken Tucker, if not getting him out directly, is getting rid of his closest ally. And people are perceiving that to be Rubina. And that is horrible. That is putting her in an absolutely terrible position. The worst part is that people actively like her. Like people want to work with her, but because she is so closely attached to Tucker, People don't perceive that as a real like plausibility. I don't think people actually think they can work with Rubina because Rubina is so closely tied to Tucker. Rubina has ties with some of these players who are in pretty good positions, such as Chemo and t -Core, but because of her association with Tucker, it's putting her in a bad position, leaving her here at number nine. Shout out my fam, my friends, and all the Filipinos, mahal kita! At number eight, I have Joseph. And Joseph is in a pretty peculiar position. Like, he thinks he's in a better position than he actually is, and it's honestly kind of funny watching it go down on the feed, but in terms of his actual like gameplay position, he's not doing as well as he thinks he is. He is fully committed to the collective and keeping that alliance together because that is Joseph's literal only alliance in this game as of right now. Joseph has been trying to build these connections with people like Tucker, but because of Tucker's blow up, Joseph has essentially been forced to boot Tucker and disassociate himself with him because Joseph doesn't want to put himself as a target. Joseph was also considered as a possible pawn this week, and that's really bad, but Joseph was able to build a really strong bond with Cedric. I mean, to the point where the two of them solidified a final two, and they were actively gaming together a lot. They were talking a lot of strategy, and Joseph was able to collect a lot of information about the whereabouts of a lot of the machinations being built in the house right now. Like, Joseph was doing a pretty good job in collecting information, but Joseph is still not actively being included in a lot of things. Like I said before, the collective is the only thing that Joseph has, and Joseph needs to branch out a lot more if he wants to go much further in this game. He simply just doesn't have some of the backing that I would personally want him to have. Like, he needs to go out and build more bonds. Like, he's able to do that with people like Tucker, but now he needs to go and do that with people outside of the collective. Maybe somebody like Aaliyah would actually be really beneficial to his game, but as of right now, he hasn't been able to do that. He's almost blindly loyal to, co to the collective, and he really needs to start branching out outside of that if he wants to do better in this game. But because he hasn't really done that yet, he is here at number eight. Do I want to be a pawn? Hmm, let me think about that. No, absolutely not. Dude, are you crazy? At number seven, I have Quinn. And Quinn's game massively blew up this week. Like, his game blew up in his face wholeheartedly. Like, I literally had to make two videos about Quinn because of how bad this blow up was for his game. Like, he was in such a powerful position. So many people trusted him. So many people wanted to take Quinn far in this game. But because of how poorly he handled his power, especially this week, like everything blew up in his face and now he is a huge target where he shouldn't have been. People like Tucker are now targeting Quinn and people like Cedric who previously trusted Quinn a lot in the past now no longer trust him 
and Quinn has a lot of catching up to do. He has to do a lot of work rebuilding a lot of the alliances he once had. He was in a power position in most of the alliances that he was being included in, but now that he is being perceived as this untrustworthy figure, nobody really wants to take Quinn as far in the game as they initially wanted, and that is really bad. Now. In full honesty, I think Quinn will be able to recover from this. It is definitely going to take him some time, but the fact that he is essentially going to be the next HOH because he is going to use his deepfake HOH, he is going to probably be able to put himself in a better position. And if he can get out some of his biggest opposition in the likes of like a Tucker or an Angela, then Quinn is going to be in a great position. I think he's going to be able to recover a lot of the bonds that he has broken in the past. I think he's going to be able to rekindle some bridges. I think he's going to be able to do all of that. It's just the fact that it all blew up in his face this week. And now a lot of people are mistrusting him that I have to put him here at number seven. It's clear that Tucker knows I have the power, but the problem for him is my strength isn't in the upgrade. It's the people that I've surrounded myself with, and he's just poked the most well-insulated bear in the game. And now, guess who's enemy number one next week? You, Tucker. At number six, I have Cedric. And Cedric played this HOH pretty poorly. Like, Cedric said he wanted to have a clean and bloodless HOH, like he wanted it to be squeaky clean, but he ends up getting the most blood on his hands out of pretty much all of the HOHs so far. It's so funny in an ironic sense that, they, that he got a house target out in Kenny, yet he put himself in a worse position than if he were to just not win HOH at all. Like, it's really bad. Mind you, Cedric was kind of cornered into a poor position because of Tucker, and Tucker essentially forcing Cedric to make a big move one way or the other, either blindsiding his own alliance in Quinn, or blindsiding Tucker by putting up Mackenzie, which he does end up doing the latter, but still, it puts Cedric in a pretty bad position to where Cedric is now being targeted by Tucker. Like, Tucker is probably one of the last people I would want ever coming after me, especially considering how well he's been doing in all of these competitions. Like. Tucker has won the last three out of the four competitions he's competed in. That is crazy. Like, Tucker is doing so well in these competitions, and I feel like if he keeps winning more, that's going to build him more influence, and that's going to turn more people against Cedric. Now, to be fair, I do think Cedric still has a lot of good allies. The fact that Cedric ratted out Tucker's plan to the collective is a huge sign of trust and basically reinforces that alliance that essentially locks them together to where Cedric has proven that he is a loyal ally, maybe a little naive in how loyal he is being, but still, Cedric is proving himself to be a loyal ally and the people in the Pentagon want to keep him around and that's honestly going to do him a lot of good work and as long as he doesn't let things explode too much like they did this week, I think he's going to be fine. But because of the whole blow up and the fact that he is being targeted, I have to put him here at number six. Yo, my squeaky clean HOH just got real dirty real fast. At number five, I have Cam. And Cam is once again in a good position by doing absolutely nothing. The fact that Cam is just this prototypical big brother player, somebody who is just this palatable, affable guy and this ally that people want to pull into all of their alliances because he is this pretty physical looking dude is honestly paying him dividends. However, Tucker's blow up actually puts him in a better position than I had been assessing him in previous weeks. Now that Tucker has positioned himself as the big physical threat of the house, nobody's really looking at Cam anymore. And that is doing a great job for Cam. Like, honestly, Cam is doing pretty good work now. He still hasn't solidified any sort of final two with anybody, and that is honestly infuriating me because we are now week three into this game, and he still doesn't have a single ride or die that he can call his final two because he has been a bit more passive in terms of like actively strategizing with people. Instead, he's choosing to showmance around with Leah. Like, I know this is like not game related, but come on, man. Like, it's obvious that she doesn't want you. Like, go, you can find somebody else. Like, Cam is, like, a really good-looking dude. He's tall. He's fit. He's a former collegiate football player. Like, he has all of these things going for him. And he has a huge social media following. Like, Cam is, Cam is going to be able to find somebody in the real world. So you don't need to be, like, obsessing over Leah. Like, she doesn't want you. Move on. You will find somebody in the future. It's just not going to be Leah. 
But getting back to his gameplay, he's still in a pretty good position. He still has the Pentagon keeping him safe. He's still this affable guy that people want to keep around for a pretty long time, it seems. And it's honestly doing him a lot of good, which is why I have him here at number five. I like Leah, but this early in the game, a showmance is never good. I also think Leah got a lot more eyes on her in the house for sure. At number four, I have Kimo. And Kimo honestly impressed me this week because of what happened with the whole Tucker blow up. Tucker essentially blew up Kimo's game unintentionally by exposing that Quinn told Kimo about the power, exposing that Kimo was lying about knowing about this power for a very long time. But what's shocking to me is that he faced very little ramifications for this action. Like he did lose a lot of trust in the likes of T-Core, which is definitely hurting his position and why he is put a bit lower. But the fact that nobody is like even mad at Kimo, hell, Quinn wasn't mad at Kimo. And Kimo is essentially the reason why this whole thing like leaked. So the fact that nobody is really mad at Kimo or looking at Kimo because of this just proves like how good of a position he is in now. And now that Tucker has essentially blown things up, this has allowed Kimo to kind of slither into a much better position. He is solidifying all of these really good allies in the likes of T-Core and Rubina and now people like Brooklyn and Tucker. Like Kimo is now being included in a lot of these things that people want to bring him into and the fact that Quinn is most likely going to be the next HOH does him even better because that's most likely going to get rid of somebody that isn't on Kimo's side that is supporting him. So Kimo is honestly in a really good position right now. He has all of these allies, he has a lot of potential to go far, he has a really solid foundation for his potential allies and if things continue going the right way I could see Kimo continuing to make a pretty deep run and it's this potential that he has to do well that puts him here at number four okay tucker is gorgeous duh but there genuinely is trust there oh <laughs> uh, if only tucker weren't straight <laughs> at number three i have t core and t core is essentially in the same position as chemo except there is no mistrust surrounding chemo in any aspect because T-Core was essentially removed from Quinn's power and T-Core had no idea about it, nobody could really look at her and really pinpoint her about the power in the way that people could about Kimo. And it's the fact that there is this lack of mistrust that can be pinned on T-Core that is paying her off really well at this point. T-Core is doing a really good job in locking in her allies. Like, yes, she did have a bit of a tiff with Kimo that did create a little bit of mistrust for the time being, but besides that, T-Core has been able to build really strong bonds with the likes of Rubina and Quinn, and it's putting her in this really, really prime position to do well. The only concern I have for her is the fact that she actually needs to capitalize on this. Because T-Core actually hasn't formalized an actual alliance with these people, T-Core still doesn't have that actual protection that she needs to carry her further in this game. And that does concern me, but because of all of the great groundwork she has been laying out in these weeks thus far, I'm fully convinced that T-Core is going to be able to do these things. I think T-Core will be able to solidify these alliances. I think T-Core will be able to put herself in a much, much better position, especially with the fact that Quinn is most likely going to be the HO next week with Quinn essentially being the next HOH through his deep fake HOH power that gives T-Core the opportunity to solidify the visionaries alliance between herself Quinn and Kimo and if she can do that I think that's going to put her in a prime position to do well in terms of finding more allies and branching out and it's all of this great potential to why I have her here at number three I set the school of nine which honestly you know not too bad now I just gotta hope that someone doesn't come in and blow my school out of the water. At number two, I have Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is doing a lot of the same good work she has been doing in prior weeks, but the reason why I bumped her down to number two instead of keeping her at number one is because of Kenny. Like, it's weird saying that because Kenny is no longer in the game, but Kenny did unintentionally or intentionally blow up Brooklyn's spot at least a little bit. Nobody was really catching on to Brooklyn's gameplay style or how Brooklyn was playing the game, but because Kenny pinned Brooklyn as the head of this 
possible all girls alliance that was pretty much non-existent at the time the fact that kenny pinpointed brooklyn as the figurehead of that alliance started having a lot more eyes put on brooklyn to where people are now starting to figure out her gameplay style people are starting to figure out that she is this more low-key under the radar figure that shouldn't be trusted and people are looking to take her out in the mid jury stages of this game and that is honestly really bad but I'm not too concerned about that because Brooklyn still has all of the great allies from the great work she's been doing in the prior weeks. Brooklyn has still been able to keep all of her allegiances secret. She I correctly identifies the fact that she should keep Quinn in her corner because even though Quinn is this big target, Quinn has this power that she can use to her advantage. Mind you, I don't know if Quinn's actually going to do what's best for Brooklyn's favor, but still, Brooklyn is able to correctly identify this and then use this to her advantage. She still has the Pentagon, she's a part of the bigger collective majority, and she still has the girls, so essentially Brooklyn is protected on nearly all sides of the house. The only issue I have is that there is a little bit of doubt surrounding her because of Kenny, and it's because of that that I have to put her here at number two. Honestly, I'm shocked that Quinn has the power and he didn't tell the Pentagon, but he is still a part of the five. I trust him. Plus, the Pentagon can still benefit from Quinn's power. At number one, the house guest I believe to be in the best position as of week three is Chelsea. And Chelsea is playing a phenomenal under the radar game right now. Like nobody's looking at Chelsea as a potential target because of how well she's been able to manage herself throughout these prior weeks. Coming off of her HOH, she essentially had no blood on her hands. And with her now being in this prime position to where she can freely strategize without having to worry about making nominations or pissing the wrong people off, Chelsea was able to do the great work that she did back in week one, except now she's able to strengthen and solidify a lot of the things that she had been setting up in prior weeks. Chelsea has continued building these alliances with some of the women. Chelsea still has the Pentagon. She still has the collective. She still has all of these makings that could put her into a better position. And now the fact that she's branching out to people on the supposed other side of the house in the likes of T-Core and Chemo, this is putting Chelsea in an even better position. I'm honestly thoroughly impressed by Chelsea with how well she's playing these early weeks. Like... Chelsea is doing a really good job at solidifying these people and having nobody look at her as a target. The fact that Kenny called out Brooklyn as the head of the All Women's Alliance and not Chelsea just proves how well ingratiated Chelsea is with the good graces of the house. People trust Chelsea. People want to work with Chelsea. People want to bring Chelsea far in the game. And that is honestly really good for her. I don't know how well I can express this, but Chelsea is doing an amazing job at solidifying all of these social bonds and evolving them into these game relationships where people want to keep Chelsea around, even though Chelsea is most likely only staying loyal to the Pentagon as of right now. And even then, Chelsea is able to correctly identify that she is going to have to eventually break off of the Pentagon anyways because of the likes of cam and cedric having this like tucker deal about trying to backdoor quinn in that instance so chelsea is even able to correctly identify in that sense that she needs to break off in not necessarily immediately but sometime in the future and it's this great positioning and this great awareness of the house dynamics to where i have to put her here at number one so i was vibing camp but camp and quinn are in love with leah and Leah is infatuated with Tucker, and Tucker is in love with, I don't know, the fish. Overall, this week was chaotic as hell. Tucker is like, what, the seventh person in Big Brother North American history to not use the veto on himself, and the fact that he won the BBAI arena and actually went through with his plan in an attempt to try and get Quinn possibly the previously best ingratiated player in the house and trying to make this big move was really, really entertaining. And I honestly wouldn't have expected it from Tucker, but at the same time, I do expect it from Tucker because he is slowly emerging as this fan favorite player that is so crazy, so erratic, so chaotic in his gameplay that nobody can predict him. And sure, he is most likely the number one house target as of right now, but we can't deny that he's bringing so much entertainment to the show. And there's other people making up for it in terms of the strategy and gameplay department, but 
people really don't see that because that's more because the most optimal gameplay as of right now is more low key more under the radar and that doesn't necessarily make for the best television but we have tucker to make up for that so it's all completely fine and if the big brother season keeps serving like this i think this is probably going to be a top tier modern big brother season possibly a top tier season like of all time sure week two was a bit of a slow point in like playing it really safe and not much to going on here but if this momentum keeps carrying on with how hectic all this gameplay can be and there's hopefully no steamroll in the foreseeable future i think this season could continue to be a great one that continues serving on all fronts but those are just my thoughts leave your thoughts in the comment section down below be sure to like subscribe and share with your friends if you have any of those and i'll see you all in the next video peace <laughs> Oh, bro. Why? I thought it was going to be so easy. It was going to be so good.